Hello, my name is Martin. Welcome back to another video. Where are we? Um, we're in Buxton. We're near Buxton. We're not far away. I'll no, we're Leek. I'll show you on the map. Yeah, not far from Leek. Because yeah. we came through Leek. He made a joke about... What's the joke? Saying that they've got a lot of flooding. Yeah, they get, always seem to get a lot of flooding around there. And then the punchline is somewhere to the Leek. Anyway, it's rubbish. Um, <laughs> we're at Cheddleton Flint Mill. What's a Flint Mill all about? I didn't know myself, but we're going to learn something today. We're going to see if we can get one of the volunteers to talk to us, tell us all about why there's a flint mill here. A fantastic working water wheel on the side of that building. We've got Timmy here and we've got Gary here who sat down like a pensioner drinking a pot of tea. Hello Gary. <laughs> Hi. This is the Colden Canal. Just down there is the River Churnet and we're not far from Leek. Okay, so this week we're in a place called Cheddleton. It's in Staffordshire, as you can see, we're to the south of Manchester, and it's a beautiful little place that James actually found. You'll also notice its proximity to Stoke-on-Trent, which will become apparent because Stoke-on-Trent was very famous for making pots. So, without further ado, let's go and take a look at Cheddleton Flint Mill. So what an absolutely stunning and beautiful location. We parked up in the small car park and just went wandering round. The staff came across us, they were more than happy to tell us about the, uh, the mills and how it all worked and everything, and more than happy that we were filming. Now, of course, we had questions about these amazing water wheels, there's two of them, um, and Flint Mill, what was that all about? Flint? I didn't understand it. So as you can see, there were two water wheels, like I say. Um, I think attached to two mills, there used to be the North Mill and the South Mill. This wheel is out of action and what the guys are telling me is that the, the axle, for want of a better word, that goes through the middle there, uh, that axle needs attention, that's, so that's why it's not working. But on the other wheel over here, this one is working absolutely fine and it was fascinating to be able to get so close up and be able to see it. Uh, working in uh, like 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 this. So anyway, back to that question, flint. Why do you grind flint? Let's find one of the volunteers who's very kindly going to explain what this is all about. Okay, so this is Nick from Cheddleton Flint Mill. So Nick, I associate flint with like Iron Age tools and that Absolutely. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I've never, what is the use of flint here in a flint mill? Right, well basically flint, in the 1690s it was discovered that if you burn flint, it turns bright white, okay? And if you then grind it into a powder, which you can see here, yeah, and add it to clay, what you end up with, very simply put, is porcelain, fine white china. Wow. Before they discovered they could put flint into clay, then they were using earthenware. And it's in the name, it's brown, it's muddy, it's earthenware basically. So flint was used in every pottery after about 1700 to make fine porcelain because it's just much nicer. The other benefit, apart from the fact it's white, is you can put color on it. Then you can have color, wow. you can add color. And they also used to grind the glazes here as well. Yeah. So they didn't just grind the flint for the pottery industry, they ground the glazes as well. Just have a squeeze. Oh, spongy. Oh, spongy. Yeah. That's because it's a sea sponge. Yeah. And flint is fossilized sea sponge. Right. 100 million years of heat and pressure and you turn a sea sponge or zillions of them dead on the seafloor into flint. Wow. Turns into a big black stinking mud that gets hard and becomes flint. But it starts off as something soft and squidgy. Right. Look at that. Now, obviously, me being me, I'm quite fascinated in the water aspect uh, of the, the mill, the, the main driving force. And you can see here, in this case, it's the River Churnet. There is a loop that comes off the Churnet there, just, just where the green, the green arrow points out that loop. That is the head race and tail race that drive those two uh, water wheels. So that's the fascinating bit for me, the way they took feed off the River Churnet. Let's go and take a look at that in a bit more detail. Well, obviously a mill race, possibly an overflow down to the river. This feeds, this goes in there, drives the wheel and then carries on down there. And that is the tail race that will head back round and rejoin the River Churnet. 
So heading inside the mill was brilliant because it's almost like it's still working. Well, it is in a way. Uh, so all the equipment's still there that would have been there back in the day. And the noises and the, uh, the machinery was fantastic. Flint was collected on the White Cliffs of Dover down on the beaches in Norfolk and South England and France where there were lots and lots of pebbles of flint. They were collected by people with baskets on their backs. They were then put into boats and brought round the coast to Liverpool. So it had to make quite a journey Oh, to it get did, it. yeah. I mean, the great thing about the potteries, potteries was great for pottery because it had coal and clay. Yeah. But as soon as people wanted porcelain and you needed flint, Right. then we had to find a source for it. But the great thing was, because this area is on the canal network, we could get the flint here, ah, of course, yeah. drop it off at Liverpool, yeah. and then down the Weaver navigation onto the Trent and Mersey Canal, down to Etruria, where you've obviously got you know, Wedgwood's original factory and so on, and then it could come up the Colden Canal, where we are, yeah. so the flint could then be processed. Brilliant. Why not process it in Etruria? They didn't have the mills, they didn't have the expertise, and they didn't have the water supply. Right, so up here is where the work uh, took place. So this pit here, you see here, this is where I think they ground up the flint, and also they took a drive now off the wheel, and they, lifted, they could lift uh, the flint up through this trap door here, but it's absolutely a fantastic here. Look at this. You've done well. You found a good place, pig. I know. Well, what can I say? I'm just like. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> You're just so brilliant. You knew it would be this good, didn't you? I anyway. just knew. That's what I thought. I thought I knew it was going to be this good. Yeah, you're really good. Right, brew up. Um, we're not going to. Uh, We've got this today. We're not going to pretend that we've made it because I think that joke's old now. <laughs> um, so we've got Raspberry Ripple, Ripple Tear and Share Bun, which we'll be checking out. And of course the usual, crack out that cake. You've not brewed up for a while. Where have you been? You've not been in videos. You didn't, we didn't, we right. didn't come to the, uh, the ferry one. Although I must admit, the ferry initially went on a Wednesday and it weren't running on a Wednesday. Yeah, you told us to come and it weren't even open. Tear, right, don't moan too much. <laughs> don't sulk too much. Tear and share. Look what I made. <laughs> but that joke's run out now. There's no that joke doesn't work anymore. Or as Morrissey would say, that joke isn't funny anymore. Tear and share. Oh look at that. Oh yes. Is there enough it's not all for you, you know. <laughs> you make sure you get that bit and don't lose out. Make sure you don't lose out. <laughs> what happened was all the flint was offloaded onto from the canal boats into the kilns outside. It was dropped into the kilns with 10 layers of flint, 10 layers of coal, and it was fired for three days. Gets it incredibly hot, up to 1200 Celsius, and it goes white and it goes soft, so you can grind it. The poor old miller, he would then get into the hovel, which is the bottom of the kiln, of the kiln outside, scrape out the pebbles, separate it from the ash, the coal ash, and then put it into a little railway truck, hence the fact we've got a railway oh, next to the kilns. That, yeah, You've yeah. seen that. He'd then push it manually across the little bridge over to the mill. And over in the north mill, there's a little railway system and a hole in the floor yep. where the uh, trap door was. Yep. And the trap door, they push the little truck, it was on detachable wheels, push it to the trap door and then hoist it up through the floor using water power. Mm. And a really famous thing called a slack chain hoist, which is oh, significant. Yeah, yeah, slack chain hoist. Yeah. Winches it up through the floor and then it could be tipped into the grinding pans on the top floor. Yeah. Lots of water added. So apparently there's been a corn mill here since the 1200s. So I'm just asking the gentleman how old is the wheel? And he said it's like Trigger's broom. The centre bit is, is like original, but um, some of the paddles are like recent. So it's all bits been rebuilt over the years and bits and pot pieces. Right, we're going to see Marina. <laughs> Did she live in here? She lived. Well, I'll show you. Oh. Reenie was there's Reenie. Oh, yeah. Irene Nichols, and she was born upstairs here in the cottage. This is oh. the Miller's cottage. Yeah. This, the originally built about 1815, but this is as Reenie remembers it when she was a little girl here. So that 
is really, I love this, that was the same lady yeah, yeah, yeah. when she was seven. In 19, so that's really in 1927. Um, same lady, and she was born upstairs. Coupland Mill, the Copeland Mill, what powered? Yeah, look. Yeah, so this was the water wheel on the other side. On the other side that powered this bit now. Hold the right. This started here in about 1760-ish as a flint mill. Yeah. But the corn mill goes back. We know there was a guy called Roger of Cheddleton working here in 1253 as a, as a corn miller. But there's evidence that there was corn milling on this site dating back to around 1100. The smell and the machinery reminds me of my old metalwork class. It smells like, like my grandma's house. What oil? <laughs> machinery? <laughs> what did she do? <laughs> reminds me of metalwork, Gary. Just Gary's just walked in. Reminds me of the old metalwork class. Yeah. The oil smell, and the machinery yeah. and everything. You yeah. Smell the grease. And all what I like about it as well is, well, th these would have turned on that other wheel that weren't you saw outside that weren't turning. But what I love about it is um, the little uh, passageways and stuff. Now I just noticed this big wheel is being held up. By Jacks. <laughs> so maybe we should be too near that. Reminds me a bit of Quarry Bank Mill if you've ever been there on a smaller, kind of more friendly scale if you like. Oh, look at this grate. Look at the old grate there. So this rather lovely looking machine was uh, came here in 1967. It was at the Minton factory, which is another factory elsewhere, um, and it was used to generate electricity, it was steam driven and used to generate uh, electricity. Hence I think that's why you've got the chimney on the outside of the mill. But uh, yeah, lovely looking thing this is. Now as idyllic as this place is, and it's absolutely lovely for a day out, if you come down one day, you can have a picnic by the canal and you can have a wander around the mill, check the opening times and everything, but as idyllic as this place is, it was a place of work and it was a place of industry and those guys that had to, uh, the millers that had to empty those kilns suffered all sorts of uh, lung problems and silicosis and uh, had short lives to be honest with you. Is that though not just the best work water wheel we've ever seen? Yeah, amazing. I think it's got to be one of the best water wheels we've ever seen. If we had both of them going together. You could produce some stuff. Yeah. It's really quite strange isn't it because we're from co the cotton mill town. Mm where we used to everything being geared towards cotton. So this pots and clay is completely almost alien to us. Yeah, yeah. And it's not, we're not that far north of here. We're only about, what, 50 mile north of here. Pretty nice. But it is quite alien that they, they do this down there. Hence me being so confused that this was a flint mill. Yeah. Right, mill was fantastic. Way to us now. So I looked at Buxton, there's like a, like a bit of a tower. Um, Sullivan, tower trail. Tower trail. We're well, getting two videos in, in one here almost. Back in the day of the tower trails. I can see it. It's it called looks... Solomon's Tower. Let's go there. Let's go. Let's go inside and have a look. Okay, so this is Solomon's Temple. I might call it Tower, but it's Solomon's Temple. If you want to Google it, you can Google it and you'll find it here just outside Buxton if you want to Google map it. Uh, grade 2 listed, built in 1896, and apparently it placed, replaced the little shelter that used to stand on the hill here. Why is it called Solomon's Temple? Well, apparently Mr. Solomon Mycock of Buxton used to rent land up here on these hills and he farmed it in the early 1800s. Um, at the time when the tower was being built, a local, ar local archaeologist, Mr. Micka Salt, undertook an excavation um, and they found that there was an early Bronze Age burial mound underneath the foundations. They found stone tools and pottery and at least 300 burials over 5,500 years old. And the items are on display at Pools Cavern Visitor Centre in Buxton. Right, so from Solomon's Temple here in Derbyshire. Thanks very much for watching. Take care. We'll see you in the next video. Bye for now. In a bit.